been here, I don't know, was it a couple months ago maybe? In March. Uh, in March. <clears throat> and uh, that's whenever everything kind of fell apart. And, and also our, our flights to Bolivia got canceled. And so we have been uh, uh, trying to get back and uh, it just hasn't, hasn't happened. I am Kenneth Elsey and I uh, have a family, sorry they're not here this morning, but I have uh, my wife Brooke and then uh, Kenzie, she's 20, 22 years old and uh, just got married in March and then Michael, he is uh, 20 years old, he just flew back to North Carolina yesterday, uh, he's in Bible College there in North, North Carolina at Anchor Baptist College and then uh, and then Matthew is 16 years old, and then Nicholas, we adopted him there in Bolivia when he was 2 years old, and now he is 11, about to be 12. And so we are the Elsie family, and sorry on, on my prayer card, I'll, I'll give you one after the service, or in between. On our prayer card, we only have two of our children on there, because the other two are not going back to Bolivia with us, so we, we just put the... The younger two on there, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background on on my family is, I was married uh, 20 years to Angie, and uh, and went to Bible college, started started Gospel Light Baptist Church in Rogers, Arkansas, and then we went to Bolivia, and then after that uh, we stayed in Bolivia almost almost 10 years, and during that time. Uh, Angie was was sick. She was sick 19 years of the 20 years we were married. And uh, right after our 20th anniversary, Angie passed away. And um, what a blessing she was! Uh, just a, a a great lady. Uh, and then I was at that time I was pastoring a church in um, Rogers, Arkansas, a Spanish church that I started. There's so much to say. I don't know where to start. And just to fill you in where we're at. But uh, right. I was pastoring a church in Rogers, Arkansas. Because we came back from Bolivia. And uh, some people say, you know, well, they came back because Angie's health was, was real bad. She was in, a, she was in a, a, a wheelchair. She was really bad off. But that wasn't the reason we came back. We prayed about... Uh, starting another church there in Bolivia and the Lord just wouldn't just give wouldn't give us peace about starting a church anywhere. We prayed and prayed and prayed and and uh, then we looked at other countries, thought maybe the Lord would move us to another country and uh, and we couldn't get peace about any other country. And so my pastor, he said, uh, would you pray about coming to the States and starting a Spanish church? And I told him, I said, well we don't we don't I mean we enjoy being missionaries. We don't want to come back to the States. And he said, just pray about it. So we prayed about it, and the Lord put peace in our heart about that. So we came back, and during that time of when we started the Spanish church, that's whenever Angie passed away. Mm -hmm. So I continued to pastor, pastor the church there, and, and then uh, the Lord spoke to my heart about going back to Bolivia. And so I, uh, I resigned the church. First, we got, I talked to a man that, uh, that would come from... Uh, he was Brother Merlo's assistant pastor uh, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City at Calvary, Calvary Baptist. Is uh, Brother uh, Ismerky de los Santos. I talked to him. He's from the Dominican Republic. He would always preach for me when I was out in town and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, he prayed about it and he took the church. And so that's a blessing. And uh, and I started the invitation again to raise support, go back to Bolivia, and. While on deputation, I was introduced to, to Brooke, and and we got married, and uh, she she had never been married before, uh, never had you know no kids, no uh, just been faithful to the Lord for for years, and her who she calls dad, which is now my pastor, uh, introduced us to to each other, and and also my dad had a part in that also. My dad's a member of that church, and <clears throat> and she took on four kids and the mission field. We we uh, got married at our uh, 
honeymoon, and the Sunday after uh, starting our honeymoon, we, we were in a missions conference in Oklahoma, and so uh, our first year anniversary was in Bolivia, and we, uh, while being in Bolivia, we were able to start a church there, uh, getting, so this was getting back to Bolivia, going to a different area, we were able to start a church, obtain property, build a building, everything in a year. It's uh, amazing what the Lord did during that time because our first church in Bolivia, they're still renting. And so it doesn't always happen that way that, that God just gives you the, the land and the money to build the building and all that. It just worked out. And so uh, we're excited about going back. And we came out of Bolivia because of... Uh, the political unrest there in Bolivia. Bolivia was kind of following the trend of, of uh, Venezuela and Cuba as their leaders, how they, how they kind of wanted to be leaders for life. Uh, and, and Bolivia was following that way. Their president had been there, Evo Morales had been there for 15 years, and he kept changing things to, to make it where he can continue to be the president. Well, uh, the people got tired of it. They had elections. And uh, it looked like he had to win by 10% of the vote, or like 10% more than the second place guy. Or, uh, uh, what else? Uh, he had to at least beat the second place guy by 10%, or have 51% of the vote. There in Bolivia, normally it's not just two people running against each other. Here in the United States, how will... How will uh, We'll have a runoff, you know, we try to narrow it down to a couple guys. Well, they'll just let everybody run. So, so if you have a conservative, you may have seven conservatives that steal each other's votes. Yeah. And, and one guy that's, uh, uh, you know... Uh, uh, very progressive. Very progressive and win because, you know, he might be the only one. And so, anyways, it looked like uh, the night of the election, it looked like that Evo Morales uh, wasn't going to win by 10%, and he wasn't going to get the 51%, so he stopped counting the votes. He told everybody to stop counting the votes, and that they would finish the next day. Well, the next day he automatically had uh, enough votes, and so everybody began to say it had to be fraud and, and things like that, so uh, overnight, his people went into some of the government buildings and burned the, the ballots and stuff so they couldn't recount or, or anything like that. So it was just a, a big mess. And the people just rose up against him. And at first the, the military was on his side. And, uh, and so we were trying to make a decision. For me, I've been in Bolivia where there's been difficult times. When we first got to Bolivia uh, in 2005, there was, uh, they were burning cars and blowing up things. Bolivia, they don't have a lot of guns or anything, but they're, a lot of them are miners, so they have dynamite and they blow up stuff. And, and, uh, and so, uh, anyways, I had experienced some of, some of the, the things that happen in the country and the, the riots and things that they have in the country. And so I, I was fine with staying, but uh, Brooke, you know, it was her first year in Bolivia, and I was just praying to make the right decision. And so I pray. I had three, three Bolivian men. Two of them were pastors. They called me and said, "You didn't get your family out of the country." And so I, uh, I, I, I took them to the airport, dropped them off at five o'clock in the afternoon because at six o'clock they were supposed to close all the roads down in the country. And, and so I dropped them off and then I went back to my house because I was going to stay and send them. And uh, about 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, my wife called me and said that they're not letting her get on the airplane. And so it was, they said that uh, in Bolivia they have a lot of problems with child trafficking. Yeah. And so you have to, both parents have to go out of the country with, with the kids or you have to have the paperwork saying that you're leaving and you have the consent of the other parent. Well, we didn't have that and all the government buildings were 
shut indefinitely until all this stuff was resolved, and so there was just no way of getting it. So I said, I will, I will go up there and and, uh, and fly with y'all. Well, now they've already shut all the roads down, and and uh, and so I get on my motorcycle and I start towards the airport. I'm the only vehicle on the road, and uh, I come up to a roadblock. There's hundreds and hundreds of people in the street, and so. This being the first night, they're kind of just getting organized, and I'm trying to just weave through these people. I'm driving my motorcycle through these people, and really that's a dangerous thing to do in Bolivia. You don't go through their roadblocks or anything because they'll, t they'll yank you off your motorcycle or out of your car and beat you. And so I was, I was, I like adventure, but I was a little uh, afraid. And so I was going through there. The second I got through that roadblock, the second one that I got to, they had a, a big bonfire in the middle of the road. Wow. All the way across the road, you couldn't uh, uh, just drive through the road. You would have to go in the ditch and go around. And I knew not to just try to fly around them because they would come after me. And so I stopped, started talking to them. They said, no, we're not letting anybody by. And I, I told them the story, and they said, well, everybody has a story. And, uh, and so I, I, I just, <clears throat> I was just like, Lord, please help me get to the airport because my wife couldn't speak Spanish and and they were just gonna have to stay at the airport for weeks you know if if uh, if I didn't get there and so I paid those people and they let me through and I ended up paying several more roadblocks paying them and about broke when I got to the airport but I, I got to the airport dropped up and now I have my motorcycle there and I don't you know I don't have any I just have to leave it at the airport. And so I just hid the key on the motorcycle, went in, we bought a ticket, and we flew to Brazil, and then we flew to the United States, and, and I, I called a, a man that had a church not far from the airport, and he sent someone to, to get my motorcycle. Well, I, had, I wasn't expecting to leave, and so I have animals at my house, and... and uh, and not prepared to just leave my house the way it was, nobody to watch my home or anything. And so when I was on my way out the door, I just hit a key outside the door. And where I live, my, my, our church is about, uh, about 40 minutes from our house. And then all the people that we know is about, um, about an hour in the other direction from our house. And so in my town, I didn't really know a whole lot of people there and so there was a guy that stopped on the side of the road to help me one day because my car was broke and that's the only day that I had met this guy. I didn't have any fellowship with him afterwards but I did have his phone number and I called him and I told him I left the key outside my house and if he could you know feed my dog and uh, and so he uh, he said sure and I uh, we have one of those those ring systems uh, uh, where you can see uh, if somebody comes in your gate and uh, so we can see that here in the United States and since we've been here there's been all kinds of people going in in, in and out my gate and so I am unsure of how my house will be whenever I get back but uh, but I ask you to pray for us God God has it all under control he knows Amen. what's uh, what's going on and and uh, we're excited about getting back and sometimes, you know, it fr frustrates you why, uh, why you can't. But, uh, but like I said, God, God knows. There's people here that would be here this morning probably, mm -hmm. but because of their health, they're just trying to make a wise decision and not be here. Right. And so, so uh, God knows about it. God knows about the coronavirus. He knows all that. So, y'all just pray with us that in God's timing that we'll get back. I, my uh, my ticket has been canceled every 15 days. They keep putting it out 15 days and then canceled. And this time they put it out September the 6th. And uh, and so because they had put it out at a distance, I contacted a few churches and just asked if if they would like for me to come. And that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, but two days ago, that flight on September 6th got canceled too. Depart from uh, from Panama to Bolivia, 
uh, <clears throat> I heard from the Bolivian consulate that uh, that I could maybe buy a ticket through them because I'm a resident in Bolivia. I could maybe buy a ticket through them, but I'd have to quarantine 14 days here in the United States in a hotel. Then when I get to Bolivia, I'd have to quarantine in a hotel for 14 days. So that's nearly a month of quarantine. And then once I get out of quarantine, I can't go nowhere in Bolivia because everything's shut down in the country. And so really it doesn't make much sense to, to do that at this at this moment for me. So uh, uh, y'all just pray that we'll make wise decisions and that God will bless me. And just a little while before we start, the, or when we start the other service, we'll show you a video, and uh, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, uh, how long do you normally go? Well, just uh, ten till five till. Okay. However you want to do. It. I have a uh, a lesson, but I also I, I I'm I'm open for questions or anything like that. If anybody would like to ask a question about Bolivia, about our ministry, about... We've been able to start uh, three churches in Bolivia and then two other works in Bolivia, like preaching points, and, uh, and then help start another church there in Bolivia. Uh, but would anybody have a question about our family, about... You just started the church. Are you going back to that church? Yes, sir. That's a new church. We had when I when I left, and I it was in the middle of the night. But I already had a young man working with me. He's 20, 20 uh, You'll see him on the video. He's twenty three years old, and uh, he's married, got two kids, and uh, in his second year of Bible college. And so uh, he's working alongside me there at that church. And when I left, he continued to, to go out there. He's a, he lives about two hours away. He would continue to go out there, but now, for the last uh, several months, nobody's been able to get out there because of the coronavirus. And, and you know how I know some churches here in the United States have never stopped uh, during the coronavirus. Some have stopped for a few weeks, did video services, but... Uh, but some have never stopped. Well, there in Bolivia, especially where our church is, it's it's out in the country. But Catholics are 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 very dominant in that area. And if we were to have service out there, then then they would have the government on us. And so, really, our church has just been suffering without uh, having anything. I've stayed in contact with some of the people there. But they don't have internet out there, so so a video service is not something they can have either. So it may be kind of like a new church plan again. We had uh, consistently uh, Sunday morning and Wednesday nights. We had consistently about 60 people coming to that church, and uh, it's a small village, but that that was a really good group coming. To, uh, that church. One one thing about Hispanics, they're they're known to be late in in everything. I mean, that was something that I had to. It was hard for me to get uh, you know accustomed to, and I don't believe that I still am accustomed to it because they would say, you know, we're going to have a birthday party and and uh, uh, it's at three o'clock. Well, here in the United States, normally you say it's it's three to five or something. You don't have you have a start time and an end time, and uh, the the Bolivians, it's you know the start time is not at three o'clock. It's uh, you know closer to four o'clock. And uh, I always got there early. I always got there before three o'clock. You know I was there ready, and and then. And then I'm waiting, and then by the time they get started, I'm ready to go home, you know. And they're just getting started, and I'm thinking, if y'all would have started on time, we would have been, you know, we could have already been home by now. Well, the reason I say that is, is uh, uh, a lot of the churches are that way. And I, I try my best, and, and I pretty much have, just always started on time, just, uh, just 
try to teach them that. The kids have to be in school on time, so uh, and that's important. Right. And God's house is important, and so I try to teach them that. And uh, sometimes I'd be preaching, and people would come in, and I'm I'm doing the invitation. They're like, "Why are you done already?" And and I was like, "Yeah, we started this time." And and so uh, that was something difficult to get used to there there in Bolivia is in time. But our church there out that we have now, our newest church, those people are those people are about 15 to 20 minutes early. They show up early. And they're excited about being there. And I don't know if it's because they, they don't have anything else to do. Uh, you know, years ago here in the United States when the preacher would come to town, it was exciting to go to the church. You know, it was exciting. Well, now we're so weighed down with so many other things that that uh, we can barely get to church. And yeah. so so uh, it's uh, I think it's exciting to them. And uh, would anybody else have another question? Yes. Sir. Uh, you said everything's shut down. How is that affecting people economically? <clears throat> well, I know the I know the preachers there are not getting paid. You know because they're not uh, they don't have a way of paying by the internet. You know or something like that. Or and so the preachers are really affected there. I believe the ones that work full time for a church. And, uh, and then a lot of the people also, where our church is, it is a, out there in that area is all dairy farms. And so cows have to be milked every day. And so they continue to work. They continue to, to, to do their job. And so most of them are dairy farmers. And, uh, but it, it has really affected the, the people there in Bolivia a lot. We've, we fed a lot of people there, just sending money there, and I've been very proud of some of the people there that that have that I've put in in uh, over buying food, and pretty much I gave them the money by transferring money to their bank account. I gave them money and and asked them to to feed the church, you know, get food to the people in the church and things like that, and. And uh, I've been very uh, proud of how that they have done, not by me asking them, but they've sent me pictures of the families that they've they've uh, fed, you know, and the food, and they've they've sent me like a uh, just a list of we bought this much rice, we bought this much this and this, and it costs this much, and just broke it down, and that's not very Bolivian, and so. Uh, but it is very Christian, amen? So yeah. amen. Uh, I, I'm excited amen. to see them uh, be accountable in that, in that sense. And uh, any other question? Cost of living pretty high. Cost of living? When we first went to Bolivia in 2005, a good, I would say, middle... Uh, uh, well, a good payment would, uh, or or month salary would be hundred to hundred fifty dollars. I mean, it that was decent, and uh, you know they they didn't make hardly any money. But over the last several years, things have changed, and and I mean it's they've got American restaurants there in the big cities now. That they, that they didn't have when I first went there. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The house that we rented years ago in, in the capital city was $550 a month. That was kind of a, an ex, expensive house, but you know, just getting there, you want your family to be safe, you want to be in a safe place, and, and things. It was $550 a month. Now that same house is $1,200 something dollars a month and so things have changed over over the years and um, uh, it's, it's so diverse in in like where our church is the people there they they probably make still make maybe a hundred and fifty dollars a month but in the city they probably make a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month so it's a, a big difference in 
and uh, and some of the things. A lot of the people in our church out there doesn't have electricity or or anything like that. So uh, <clears throat> anybody else? Whatever you want to do for the next 20 minutes. You know, All right, if you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. In this, I'll give a little bit of my testimony in this uh, this morning. Matthew chapter 14, and we'll start reading in verse 22. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, And straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get in, into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the water, or walking on the sea and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were troubled saying it is a spirit and they cried out for fear but straightway Jesus spake unto them saying be of good cheer it is I be not afraid uh, and Peter answered him and said Lord if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water and he said come and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the winds boisterous, he was afraid and, begin, and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. I'll just stop there. Lord, I thank you for this morning. God, I pray you bless these services. Thank you for this church. And Pastor, Lord, I pray that you would just, just bless the... The, the singing, everything we do this morning, that it would honor you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, you know, uh, this story, I believe everybody knows the story of, uh, of Peter walking on the water. and, and uh, But there's just a few things that I would like to point out to you this morning. Is how that, that Peter, before he could walk on the water, he had to get direction from the Lord. He had to, uh, you know, Bible says that he called out to the Lord and he he asked Him, he said, uh, Lord, can I come to You? And if the Lord would have been silent, you know, he would have been ignorant to get out of the boat. If the Lord wouldn't have said come, then, uh, you know, he would, have, he would have probably made a mistake by getting out of the boat. And... Uh, uh, so one thing that we need in our life is direction from God. Amen. You can say we need to get a word from the Lord. We need to get direction from the Lord in every decision that we make. You think about it, you know, I know people that, that have said, Pastor, uh, pray pray for me. I'm, I'm praying about buying a house. And then the next thing you know, they, they bought the house. And I'm thinking, well, well, did the Lord tell you to buy the house? And and sometimes later on, further further on into paying the, the house payment, you're like, I can't pay the payments. You know, and, and uh, you're struggling and all those things. And, and then you say, well, Lord, you said you would take care of me. And he's saying, I didn't tell you to buy the house. You know, right. sometimes we, <laughs> we, uh, we get uh, uh, maybe a little, uh, we're quick to move before God gives us direction. And, uh, and so we need to get direction from God. We need to ask Him, pray about it, and sometimes, uh, you know, we're just looking for the answer we want. We're looking for, uh, whether it's to buy a new car or we're justifying why we should buy a new car. Hey, sometimes we need a new car. Sometimes right. God will give us the money and say, yeah, buy that car. You need it. And, but sometimes... We just make the decision without the direction of the Lord. And when we do that, then we'll find ourselves in trouble later on. That's spiritually... Uh, I remember whenever uh, God called me to preach. When He called me to preach, I was 20, 23 years old. My dad had pastored a church for 18 years in Houston, Texas. and, and uh, 
But you know, I, I, I was good at football there in the town that I grew up in, and, and that was pretty much the reason I passed school, because it was a public school. It was pretty much the reason I passed school, because I was good in football. And they... It wasn't a very large school. They wanted me to play on the team, and so anytime I failed a test or anything, the, the coaches were like asking the teacher, can he take it again? And they would bring me in the field house, and they would, they would try to help me with the test, and I, I kind of got pushed along. I was 23 years old and couldn't even hardly read in English. And, uh, and so when God called me to preach, I thought, how in the world am I going to, how in the world am I going to preach? You know, I, 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 I can't read. But you know, I, I remember a day as a teenager when I said, Lord, here's my life. I give it to you. And whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And when he spoke to me about preaching, then, then uh, he gave me direction. And when God gives you direction, you got to, you got to act upon that. Amen? And Amen. so uh, we need direction in our life. Just like Peter, uh, God told him, or Jesus told him, get out of the boat. And then secondly, we need to believe that we can. Well, once we get direction in our life, we need to believe that we can do the thing that God has asked us to do. Amen. You know, uh, right. uh, think about this. Peter could have said, God, can I get out of the boat? He says, yes, come. And then he says, oh, that storm looks pretty scary. You know, and, and I don't know if I can do that and, and doubt the Word of God. God spoke and He acted. And we need to believe that we can do what, what, what God has asked us to do. Whether it's teaching a Sunday school class or, or uh, uh, just whatever, maybe giving to missions. Uh, you know, I, I give to missions and I love to give to missions. I, I sacrifice to give to missions and, and uh, sometimes it amazes me the amount that God lays on my heart to give to missions. But as long as I know He said that's what I want, yeah. then I can step out of the boat. Amen. I can, you know why? Because when I step out of the boat, I am stepping on His Word. I am I'm having faith in His Word to say, God, I'm trusting You and, and I'll do what You asked me to do. Mm -hmm. When we went to Bolivia and we got there and things were crazy and, and I remember... On, on TV, they don't really censor the things. Uh, 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 there was just fighting in the street and thousands of people would walk down the streets and, and they would bang on your gates and things and uh, just throwing rocks and burning burning cars and different things. And I remember uh, uh, on, on this TV watching the news and trying to see what was going to happen there was a, a guy that got cut by a machete and it, it showed it. It showed people that got shot and, and different things. And I remember my, my oldest boy saying, uh, coming in there, and I didn't realize he was behind us watching and, and he was asking. He was asking, are, are we going to be okay? And I mean, he's just a little bitty boy. And he's, and he's, he's, he's scared and he's, and he's worried and those things. And I thought, Lord... What are we going to do? But you know, I could go back to the time whenever God said, I want you to go to Bolivia. I want you to go to Bolivia. And I stepped out by faith. Yeah. And I'm standing on His Word. And no matter what was taking place in the country, I could say, Lord, this is where You have me. Right. This is where You want me. And we can have all confidence in God's Word. Yes. Uh, we must believe that we can. You know, when I after God called me to go to Bolivia, I was pastoring Gospel Life Baptist Church, and and I, uh, you know, I thought, Lord, I, I don't even know English. I I I uh, I'm very dyslexic, and so when I read, I always tell people I have a King James Bible, but sometimes I take words out, I put words in, and you know, and, and uh, but <clears throat> I thought, Lord, I don't even know English. How am I going to learn Spanish? <laughs> and he said, this is what I want you to do. And so I had to step out by faith again and just trust Him that He would, he would make things uh, 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 happen that need to happen. And you know, I went to language school right before we went to Bolivia and it was supposed to be a year long of school. 
I got down there at the border of Texas. They had trained thousands of people to learn Spanish. Like I said, it was supposed to be a year-long school. I was there three months, and the president of the school called me into his office. He said, Brother Elsie, I think you need to pray about another country. And I said, why? And he said, I don't think you're ever going to learn Spanish. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, that was disappointing. That was disappointing. And, and, uh, and, but I, I could go back to what God spoke. I could go back to His Word, His direction in my life and saying that I know that He called me and, and so I'm going to continue to do what He's asked me to do. We left the language school. We didn't, we didn't learn anymore there at that language school. We left. We went to Bolivia, moved out in the jungle and began to try to speak to the people out there. And as we spoke to those people and, and just day after day trying to... To, to read a Bible study to people and things. I told my wife, I said, we're just going to have to start a church. You know, I, I, I don't know enough Spanish to start a church, but we're just going to have to start. We're going to have, or we're never going to start a church. And so uh, we, were, we were praying about it and we set a date. We began to hand out invitations and invite people. And our town was only about a town of 2,500 people. And and uh, our very first Sunday, we had 126 in attendance. We had 11 people that accepted Christ that day. And, you know, it, it's amazing to see what God can do whenever we, when we just rely on His Word. Amen. When He speaks in our life, whether it's, uh, hey, I want you to be a blessing to your pastor and do this. or And you know what we do? We talk ourselves out so much of the time. Amen. Oh, I don't have the money to be a blessing to so-and-so. But if God is nudging you, he, you, when you step out of the boat, you're stepping on His Word. Amen. His promises. Amen. Thirdly, you can't focus on the storm. You can't focus on the storm. I remember many people told us that we couldn't go to Bolivia because my wife had uh, autoimmune disease, polymyositis, and she was very sick. Very sick, and they said, "How you know? I mean, the, the people here in the United States have a hard time treating her. How how are they they going to be able to treat her there in Bolivia?" He's stepping out on His word. Amen. Say, God can do things that we can't do. Don't focus on the storm. Just whenever that guy told me to quit, I wanted several years later. I wanted to send him some pictures of of the churches that we started our very first church. Uh, our first year anniversary, we had over 400 in attendance and 30-something people uh, came to know Christ that day. And You know, it's just uh, amazing what God did there. I wanted to send Him some pictures. I'd have done it in the wrong spirit, so I didn't send Him any pictures. <laughs> right. <laughs> but don't focus on the storm. Amen. There's always, any time you say, Lord, hear my... Anytime you say, I, I'm going to commit to read my Bible. I'm going to commit to give to missions. I'm going to commit to, to uh, teaching a class or whatever. Anytime you commit to do something, there's going to be a storm there. Amen. There's going to be some type of discouragement that's going to try to keep you from doing what God's asked you to do. Amen. And so we can't focus on those things. We've got to uh, just move move through. You know, he gets out and he, that storm was there before he even got out of the boat. Before he even asked, can you imagine? We, uh, we a lot of times, have a hard time stepping out by faith when everything is going well. But can you imagine in the middle of a storm? Mm -hmm. He says, God, can I step out by faith? God, can I do something that others aren't doing? Yeah. Don't. You can't focus on the storm. Then, then lastly, don't listen to the ones in the boat. I can imagine the other guys there saying, "Man, you're crazy. You're crazy." And I, I you know, I, I've. It's always you, you see. I've seen years of. Teenagers going to camp and their lives being changed and and uh, they come back. My my little boy Nicholas just went to camp uh, two weeks ago in in Arkansas and and uh, God called him to preach. He's already preached three times. He preached last week in a camp meeting over a, 
a couple hundred people there, and and uh, and but I've seen so many times when when people are are called to do something, then we throw water on what God has asked them to do. I've seen yeah. in Bolivia where young men have been called to preach, and their parents want them to to uh, go to college. They they want them to go to college and have a real life instead of preach the word because they know how they treat treat the pastors over there. They don't pay them very well. They yeah. used to they used to say the the pay of a of a uh, of a Bolivian pastor was needed to be the same as a avanil as a like a, a bricklayer. And they said, now the, the bricklayer makes good money. So they've changed their mind. And it's, you don't leave it that way. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lower thing. But, you know, don't listen to the people in the boat. Amen. There's always going to be people that will discourage you from doing God's will. Amen. When, you, when you commit to, to say, hey, I'm going to give to missions, and it doesn't make sense to you, the amount that God has laid on your heart, you don't understand it, but you say, I know this is what God has asked me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And you step out of the boat. You know what? There's going to be other people that say, you're crazy. You know, you could have a new truck for the amount of money you give to missions. You could have a nice home for the amount of money you give to missions. You know, uh, uh, there will be other people that will try to convince you not to do what God has asked you to do. Are you willing to step out of the boat this morning? I'll, I'll just stop right there. Lord, I thank You this morning for this church. Thank You for the opportunity to preach Your Word. Pray that You just bless the remainder of the service in Jesus' name. Amen.